This show is sponsored by Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. D E N T E N.io. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denten, you're giving back on a global scale. Hello, all my entrepreneurs and business leaders, and welcome to the Michael Esposito Show, where I interview titans of industry in order to inform, educate, and inspire you to be great. My guest today is a professional speaker, former CEO of the Hudson Valley Renegades, an entrepreneur, fellow Toastmaster, and an inspiration to me. Today, he is helping organizations communicate better by using the Goldilocks approach. He is the president of Weissman Success Resources. Please welcome my friend and mentor, Skip Weissman. Welcome, Skip. Hey, Michael. Great to be here. Great to have you on. I didn't want you to, uh, to see my opening because I, I mentioned my affinity for you a few times in there. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, um, it's embarrassing. That's <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, when I joined Toastmasters, you were very active in the club, mm-hmm. and um, I remember my very first day at Toastmasters. Amode, the the current president at the time, uh, gave a speech, mm-hmm. and he, he gave a really good speech. And I remember sitting there saying, "I want to be able to speak like that." And I had the opportunity to hear you as a uh, Toastmaster, which is like a master of ceremonies of the day. I had the opportunity to hear you as a speaker. And I also had the opportunity to pick your brain and learn from you and attend some of your workshops. And I think that is just amazing, an amazing experience for me because at no point did you ever say to me, hey, Michael, break out your checkbook. Mm-hmm. It was always free learning, and um, you were always accessible to me, and you still are. Yeah. And so I, I really appreciate that, and I thought I, I wanted to make sure I shared that with you and with our audience is that so many people ask at our Take Action events and at different right. events, how do you find a mentor? And to me, um, I've learned that mentors come in our lives, and it has yeah. to do with us reaching out to them and accepting what they offer and then applying what they teach yeah. us and then kind of giving it back and paying it forward to them as well or paying it forward to someone else. And so um, that's why you get that title, sir. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's true. I mean, in a lot of the stuff I do that you, know, you and I connected with and some other folks I've, I've worked with, uh, it, it is paying it forward because I had people do similar stuff for me back in my day. I had a guy when I was coming up in the baseball uh, industry who I was referred to after a job. Um, it was a part-time, it was a seasonal job getting started in baseball, an internship as, as you heard of. Well, first general manager I, I ever worked for uh, said, hey, on your way home, stop in Richmond, Virginia and meet this guy, Richard Anderson. He was the CEO of the Richmond Braves. The team was owned by the Braves. It was right after the season ended, mid-September. Gave me a tour of the ballpark, chatted for about an hour, and, and um, at the end of the conversation, he says, here's my card. Um, uh, we don't have anything for you right now, but things will open up as the season evol- uh, end of the season evolves. He says, uh, give me a call every couple of weeks, and you can call me Collect. Now, in today's wow. day and age, nobody knows what calling Collect means. But this is back in the 80s, and for those who don't know, call and collect meant the receiver would accept the long-distance charges. I would be calling from New Jersey down to Richmond, Virginia, and he gave me the opportunity. He accepted my call like two or three times between mid-September and uh, right around Thanksgiving. Um, And then a week after Thanksgiving, I get a call from some guy in Anderson, South Carolina, who had worked with Richard uh, two years prior, who offered me a job. And, you know, Richard didn't have to do that. You know, he didn't have to... uh, you know, just accept my long distance calls, just some one of God knows how many job seekers, you know. Um, and so um, that's that's what I do this for. I, I, I pay it forward because of what he did for me and really launched my baseball career full time after my internship. So. Hmm. What was that experience like for you? Um, I'm thinking of the first phone call that you made, that first mm-hmm. collect phone call. What went through your mind? How did you feel in that moment? <clears throat> Well, a little anxious, uh, yeah. you know, because you never know if somebody's going to be true to their word. Right? Right. Maybe it's just been a, a throwaway line or whatever. But uh, so there's a little little anxiety there to to check in, almost like a cold call, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it worked out really well. And uh, he said, you know, right, uh, again, it was one of those things, don't have anything yet. Uh, things are still shaking out, but, um, you know, give me a call back in a few weeks. And I didn't actually have to call him back again. I got the call from this other guy down in, uh, it was Anderson, South Carolina, a few weeks 
weeks later. And it so, happened a few weeks later. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I was just speaking with uh, somebody on my team about this, about the kind of like uh, six degrees um, of separation with people sometimes mm -hmm. in that you, you never know where one person's going to lead you to and to yep. take those opportunities. Um, going back to some opportunities that you, you experienced, um, it's funny, we're talking about mentorship and, and mentors to some extent mm -hmm. and, and you not knowing that, that you even are a mentor right. to me and in your bio to me, you wrote that your dad was a mentor to you mm -hmm. and it was like unknowingly for you and, and for him too. And so I'm interested in that relationship and what you learned from him and um, what the experience was like. Yeah, so uh, just like every kid growing up, one, uh, as an older adult today, I look back and see all the things that um, I was interested in as a kid that, you know, I don't know that he really was interested in, but he became interested in because I was interested in it, right? Mm. Um, and... Uh, to me, it was just natural because that's what I wanted to do, and he just sort of came around. I just thought it was, uh, but then looking at back as an adult, I'm saying you know, I don't know that he really cared about any of this stuff till I started showing an interest in it, right? <laughs> um, but he wanted to do it because I wanted to do it, I guess. And it's it's a typical old school father son relationship, you know. Uh, my wife laughs at me because every time I watch the movie Field of Dreams, I uh, you know I get teary. Uh, because it's all, you know, the, the end of the movie, Field of Dreams, if you've ever seen it, you know, uh, Kevin Costner, you know, asked his father, you know, to play catch. And at the end of the game, at the end of the, of the movie, because his father comes back with, you know, Shulis Joe from the, the cornfields and everything, and, you know, he says, Dad, you want to have a catch? And it just, it just breaks me down every time, because that's what we used to do. You know, me and my dad used to play catch all the time on, the, on our front lawn. And uh, as I was building my baseball uh, skills, which never really got very, uh, very, very good. But um, so he was always there for me, you know, and, and my mom, too. So if you don't want to don't want to diss her. Mom was another thing because I'll, I'll never forget this. You know, as, as you move up in Little League Baseball, you know, the kids get a little bit older. The balls come at you a little bit faster and, and everything. And every time I have to go up to that next level, you know, you go from T-ball to you know minor leagues to major leagues or whatever. I was always afraid to go up to that next level, you know, and I would always tell my mom when it came time, uh, you know, I, I don't think I want to play this year, right? But she always made sure on that Saturday morning when it came time for registration that she took me down to the library or the school or where it was to register. I got registered for baseball um, for that year. So, you know, both of them, both mom and dad were both uh, instrumental in just you know, reinforcing the fact that you be what you want to be, do what you can do, Um and uh, I was the first person to go to college for my family right, right out of high school. And mm. so they, uh, they made it happen for me. So. You, you said your dad had, um, you taught, you, you learned uh, work ethic from him. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what did he do? What was he, what was he doing around the house or at work that it, showed you that? It, it was mostly just uh, his, his commitment to just going to work every day. You know, um, <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't easy for him. Uh, you know, he was a butcher uh, wow. for AMP supermarkets he, for 35 years. And, you know, he worked overtime on Friday nights. He always worked late Friday nights till about nine o'clock to get the overtime pay and stuff. Um, he and my mom would go out to movies and then partying and dancing on Saturday night. Then get home at two, three in the morning, and on Sundays he'd get up at seven a.m. and whatever, and you know, work his shift on. Uh, at AMP on on Sunday, so I just always always remember that. You know, he, he, I don't think he ever missed a day of work um, that I can remember, unless he was really he had to be really really sick not to and, not, not to go in. You know, and uh, uh, so yeah, it was just that he was always always, was always going. there. Yeah, I, I knew we had a lot in common uh, with public speaking and Toastmasters, and then I saw that you studied communications and got a bachelor's in communications, as did I at Marist. Mm -hmm. um, but my father was also a butcher. Get out of here. Yeah. No. <laughs> he he came up as a butcher before he became a PA, but he was a butcher. And oh. uh, and I've heard so many stories about, you know, him being a butcher and, you know, working on the block yeah. and the way he would cut the meat. And even till, to, till today, I mean, if, if my yeah. knives aren't sharp in my house, I, I, I hear it from him. So. I, had, I, had the, I had the best meat growing up. That's right. <laughs> I had the best cuts of meat growing up. Yes. That, that would cut him the way... 
yeah. he wanted them and, and everything. Yeah. And and you learn so much from the way that watching him cut. I mean, if, if you were yeah. in the kitchen with him, which yeah. I'm, I'm sure, right? And and for me too, like even with, with a chicken breast, mm -hmm. I, I can't just take a chicken breast out of the package and put it on the grill yeah. or whatever. I have to cut the meat, the, the fat off the sides and kind of like do the things that I see my dad do. And uh, it's pretty cool. He's, he's got, he still has an old butcher block mm. in, in his kitchen. Uh, we, we have, as you know, hand me down, my, both my parents passed away, but uh, my wife actually just a few weeks ago when we were redoing our, our kitchen and she pulled out this, uh, you know, the, the spike that yep. you sharpen the, sure. the, the, the knives on and she, she pulled that out and we were, we were sort of looking at it, reminiscing, like, hey, this thing's been in the family for 50 years or, or, or more, probably. Yeah, it's an incredible profession. I mean, I remember growing up, there was a butcher shop down the block from us. I grew up in Queens. This was on Parsons Boulevard and it was Leo's Meat Market. And we would always go there, and it was the it was with the sawdust on the ground yeah. on the floor, and uh, and I remember this one guy Ray. He would always pick me up and put me on the on on one of the like side things uh, high enough for me to sit there and always cut me a couple slices of bologna while my dad and him talked shop and ordered some meats and all this yeah. other stuff. It was it's a pretty neat experience. Uh, I don't know if that still exists. No, it's 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 a different world. But you know, my my grandfather, my father's father, actually owned a butcher shop in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, and then after I was born, it it faded away and everything. Actually, he died uh, before I was born. I'm named after him. Um, so my dad never got the opportunity to to work in his father's butcher shop, but he ended up going to work at A and P for forever. Um, you you said you're named after him. I'm I'm interested in the meaning of the name Skip. And if it's short for anything, because it's such a unique name. <laughs> that's, well, that, that, that's a whole another story. I don't know if you have time for it. No. Uh, uh, my grandfather's name was Irving. So my given name is Irving. Okay. Um, my mother didn't like the name because it was a family name and she had no say in okay. naming me. Right. <laughs> so when I came home from the hospital, she started calling me Skip. Now, there's a debate in my family between who gave me the name Skip. It's either my mom or my older brother. Um, that we'll never know because they're both passed. But um, yeah, so I, I was called Skip. I don't know where it came. I really so, so Skip is not on your birth certificate yeah. or a driver's license. Irving mm -hmm. is. No, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so for official documentation, uh, it, it, it's Irving, but uh, only except for my most mean cousin still call me that. <laughs> so you're like uh, Magic Johnson. You have a nickname for Irving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so from from growing up and, and in baseball, and we're going to talk a lot more about your baseball career because it has to do with you uh, being the CEO of the Hudson Valley Renegades, mm -hmm. which is a minor league baseball team in the Hudson Valley and and has had some some pretty great success in yeah. terms of bringing up some some players into the majors. Um, I think one of the notable ones is <clears throat> the guy who played for Tampa Bay, right, not too long ago and was a pretty pretty big success. Sure. Uh, I, can't think of, I can't think of his name. I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm a basketball guy, not a, not yeah. a baseball guy. Um, but anyway, moving, moving into your communications, um, you, you speak about it a lot in your bio to me. You and I have talked mm -hmm. about it a lot. You help business owners and their teams mm -hmm. um, overcome challenges in their workplace through communication. What I'm interested in is is what first propelled you into the idea of getting a bachelor's in communication. What was what was the thought process into getting that degree for you? Well, originally it was because I wanted to be a sportscaster. I knew I couldn't play baseball at the level I needed to to mm -hmm. be a major league baseball player. My original goal was to be the first next first baseman for the New York Mets, and that ended after my high school season, uh, last my senior varsity season. Actually, I fouled a pitch off the off the bat barrel directly into my wire rim glasses in my seventh game of my varsity season. So um, did was there a true opportunity to play college and minor for you? No. No, no. I was a, I hit two twenty in high school. So even before the uh, well, fouled pitch. Uh, uh, no. But I like to say the end of my career. <laughs> okay, but, sure. Uh, no, I was, we'll I give was, you that. I wasn't going anywhere. Um, so I knew I had to do something else to stay close to the game. So I wanted to go into broadcasting. And so that was the, the crux of the communications degree. The whole broadcast journalism school was, was inside mm -hmm. the school of communication. Um, but, you know, I also had to take other just general communication courses in addition mm -hmm. to the broadcast stuff. Um, but that was my original intent. Um, Were you already, um, and I wouldn't, I, I don't know if you consider yourself an extrovert or an introvert at this time, but um, were you already um, speaking publicly or an extroverted type of personality at no. the time? No. No, I, I hated people speaking public. I was <laughs> just like everybody else. I would be nervous and anxious getting 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 up in front of a room um, until 
I had to do it. So it was funny. When we were interns, I was an intern in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, with my first minor league baseball team, and they hired three interns, and all three, and they gave us an apartment right behind the ballpark in this neighborhood that they uh, where they own the, this house. And so the three of us worked together during the season, and the general manager, a woman by the name of Frances Crockett, a very well known family down in Charlotte, uh, didn't. She was very uh, introverted, did not like going out in public and speaking. So anytime they would get a request from a Rotary or Kiwanis or something, they would send the boys. And so the three of us would be this little triumvirate. We would go out and, and, and put on this dog and pony show for Rotary and Kiwanis. That was sort of my first experience of speaking um, publicly in that type of forum, uh, representing the baseball team. And so the three of us put on this little you know show and, that's where I started getting a little more comfortable in being in front of audiences. <clears throat> in fact, um, after after our session, I actually do have a Rotarian coming in who's been in uh, Rotary for over mm. 40 years. And I attended my very first Rotary meeting, mm. and that's how I met him. And I didn't realize uh, how a Rotary meeting is run and where it's, there's an audience, essentially. And he had a podium, and he, yep. and he spoke about the grant that he's working on. And... Um, it, it's it's a really great forum for people who want to get their dip their toes in public speaking, yes. learn about public speaking. I think part of it is also because it's a warm environment. It's a, it's a supportive environment. Yes. Um, it allows you room to make mistakes, which I think is also very important. Uh, so I think that that's uh, when we think about our, our entrepreneurs and executives who are listening. Um, you know, Warren Buffett attributes his success to taking his Dale Carnegie public mm -hmm. speaking courses yeah. and being able to express himself and share his knowledge. And so it's so important for our listeners, for our audience, for anybody out there trying to be successful um, to be able yeah. to stand in front of a room and speak. And uh, I think that's a really great tip right there that you just mentioned there of being able to just start. Yeah, you have to you just have to get out there and do it. You know, <laughs> there's there's no. Uh, no substitute for, for for doing it. You know, I'm actually working on a program now um, called um, Communication Confidence. And the whole, there's a thing called the the confidence, competence loop, which means, you know, you gain confidence by building competence, right? Now, there's some other steps involved in order to get out there to build the confidence, um, the, the competence, mm -hmm. so you can get the confidence and you have to have some other mindset stuff. But that's sort of what I'm, what I'm working towards is to help, teach people communication competence so it builds their confidence on uh, different levels because public mm -hmm. speaking is one area mm -hmm. but you really have to develop the skills of your own interpersonal one-on-one -on -one conversational uh, uh, competence as well and then your own internal communication competence which you know challenges us more than anything else and I think, so I took public speaking because I was communications as well. So I took some of the same courses that you may have taken as well. And uh, I remember in our public speaking courses, the big focus is really on uh, putting your speech together and speaking and getting in front of the room. But they don't put much focus on what you're talking about here, and, and I do it in my courses as well. Is is that internal confidence? Is that that's plays such a that that's probably one of the biggest roles. Um, uh, I think that is important to to pay attention to as a public speaker right yeah it's uh, it's it's the mental game right you know there's somebody wrote the you know 50 years ago someone wrote the inner game of tennis right? it's everything right there's it's, it's mental. the, it's, it's, the yeah. it's the inner game you know yogi bear said you know 50 percent of this game or you know 80 percent of this game is 50 percent half mental or whatever so yeah uh, it, it it's uh, you, you can't do anything else until you get your your internal dialogue and and, and monologue uh, aligned right and that's that's where your confidence really emanates from you know? yogiisms are the best yeah I, I like the one uh, um if you if you don't have a plan <clears throat> then you're going to end up somewhere or something like that really? I, I'm not I forget sure which one I've, it is it's like if you don't if if you don't have a plan you'll end up Nowhere. Anyway, um, what I want to ask you is about, so, so you take this communications degree uh, because you're going to be a play-by-play -play broadcaster, yes. uh, but you are not a play-by-play -play broadcaster. So no. what happened along the way that shifted um, where you decided to go? So I went to Ohio University, and Ohio is a great broadcast journalism program. Um, my senior year at OU, I was taking an advertising course. And as you know, in most colleges, you're 
um, when you're in senior level courses, there's graduate students that will take the same course and they just have to do like extra work to, mm -hmm. right, to, the, to get their uh, graduate points credits. And in that advertising class, there were three or four students from the Ohio University Sports Administration Program, which was a master's degree mm -hmm. where you earned a degree in, it was basically an MBA, but focused on sports. Okay. It was called an MSA, Masters of Sports Administration. And uh, one of the requirements of the uh, sports administration program was to do a practicum where they would promote an event. They, they would create and promote their own event on campus. Um, and the event that was very popular for many, many years, I don't know if they still do it, it was called Friday Night at the Fights. And they would take every day, your average everyday student, get them together and do like a month-long training with the boxing coach, the club sport boxing coach at school, and they would put on a fight card on Friday night. So it would be Friday night at the fights. Uh, the hockey arena, bird arena, they would pack the place for Friday night at the fights. And so their main job in this advertising course was to build up the skills and the, uh, the, the advertising marketing plan for this Friday night at the fights. And they would then want radio commercials produced. So I worked at the radio station being in broadcast journalism and the, the college radio station, which was a major Southeast Ohio uh, public broadcasting station. I would take them up to the studio just like we're doing here. And I produce a radio spots for them. And during our conversations, they tell me about the sports ad program. And they say, you, know, you, should, you should really apply for the sports ad program. And so I did. Uh, so I graduated in June of 1981. And a week later, I started my master's degree in sports administration, and that was really what I wanted to do more of. I, uh, when I learned about it, I realized, yeah, I would rather be on the inside of of the game, mm. working for the actual team itself, as opposed to being on the outside, being the journalist, uh, right. the adversarial role as the, the of the broadcaster or the, mm -hmm. or the or the journalist. Um, and so when I realized I could actually start working for a, the actual team itself, I went into sports administration. That's what really um, enamored me and why I did that. And the requirement in the sports ad program was an internship. You had to do an internship with a professional organization or a major college organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my whole focus was on getting into baseball. And so that's what I did. I got an internship in Charlotte, North Carolina with, a, with, with the, the Hornets. Orioles. It was, it was, uh, no, back then it was the, uh, the Charlotte Orioles. They were okay. a double-A affiliate for the Charlotte, uh, Baltimore Orioles. Wow, that's pretty good. The year after Cal Ripken Jr. played there. So the year Cal, after. I miss Cal Ripken <laughs> by a year. I know who he is. And actually, I, I, I kind of remember the name, so I jotted it down. Longoria. Oh, yeah. Does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. uh, what was his name? Do you remember it at all? Evan. Evan yeah, Longoria. Yeah, I, re I remember when he was playing for the Renegade, or when he came out of the, he, he had finished he was, playing for them. And yeah, he was, he, um, it was probably deeper than a cup of coffee he was only with the renegades for a very very, very short, short time short and then he played for the the rays yeah the tampa, tampa bay rays mm -hmm. right and that's when i had found out he had played for yeah. the renegades and people that was kind of like a lot of people in in my group or circle or people that i knew were like oh you know they got they got yeah. a major league player that came out of there yeah no, there's, there's, and i'm sure there's, there was plenty others yeah there's, there's been a number that uh, I'm not, i think he was there the year after i left um but yeah there's there's been dozens of players that played in the major leagues that have gone through gone, the Renegades. Gone through them. And we had the opportunity of uh, seeing each other again at Renegade Stadium yeah. not too long ago. We were at the uh, Dutchess County Chambers yeah. Mixer, which yeah. was held at the, Duchess, at the at Dutchess Stadium, which is where the Renegades play. Yeah. And um, while we were there, you shared with me some of the stories that yeah. took place in order to get it there. So I'd like to, we don't have to get into all the specifics that you had shared that day. And, uh, and I, there was an attorney a present holding us accountable, <laughs> which, 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 which made it fun. <laughs> For, uh, took, took some storytelling out of it, but yes. today you get to storytell a little bit. Uh, what I'm interested in here is, so we're, we're talking about how you kind of went from making a decision of joining, uh, of, of learning communications mm -hmm. and thinking that you're going to do play by play and be a journalist. Yeah. And uh, a, a word that everybody uses today is pivoting mm. and, and pivoting and, and seeing where you really want to go and, and where yeah. you may have had more opportunity to be closer to your passion, right. which is so important for, for our listeners to understand is like um, when we're working, when we're working in an industry or towards a goal or something, it's important that we 
align with our passions and with, with our reason for being. Yeah. Because when it doesn't align, it makes it really hard. And it sets up barriers that are really challenging to overcome. And so for you, yeah. you were fortunate in finding your passion and mm-hmm. something that lined up well with it. And yeah. um, through that, you ended up meeting some really great people along the way and helping bring yeah. minor league baseball to the Hudson Valley. I would love for you to share a little mm-hmm. bit about you know that story of how you were able to go from being an intern having wow. a wonderful opportunity in Char- Charlotte, yep. and then moving up the ranks to be able to bring a minor league team yeah. to the Hudson Valley. Yeah. Well, that, that is a long story, and I don't know if we have time for, for everything, so I'll try to... Uh, well, yeah, we don't have to get into all of the... Uh, <laughs> the abbreviation of it. Uh, yeah, but, but there were some things that in there that if you don't remember to yeah. bring up, no worries, I'll bring them up, because yeah. I remember when you shared it with me, are such learning so, experiences. Yeah, it depends on where you want to start. I mean, you know, I went from Charlotte, and then that friend, uh, Richard Anderson... Uh, uh, the friend of Richard Anderson called me, you know, and he was in Anderson, South Carolina, which is, you know, Anderson's cl- claim to fame is it's 10 miles from Clemson University. And as a 23-year-old right out of college, out of his internship, it was, you know, it was attractive to be 10 miles from Clemson University. Um, so, with the, you know, you talk about people who, you know, bring you along along the way and another mentor. Well, that guy, Bill McKay, who was running the team in Anderson, we worked together in Anderson for a year, and then he got hired in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he said, Skip, I'm going to Greensboro. Do you want to come with me? So he took me to Greensboro, a much bigger market from Anderson, South Carolina. Um, and I worked with Bill for two years um, in in, Ander- in in Greensboro. So we were together for three full seasons working together, who actually happens to work uh, live down in Fort Myers, Florida. So we're on the, I don't know when this is going to air, but the, we're on the cusp of mm-hmm. Hurricane um, Ian. Um, the whole Fort Myers area is decimated. I texted Bill. He's he's fine, but out of out of power like everybody else. Um, but 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 he's safe. But um, you know, so we've been friends for forty years. Uh, he got promoted to another team in 1986, and they the ownership group asked me to step up to be the president, vice president, and CEO of the team. So I was 26 years old. Wow. So you're talking about you know being in the right place at the right time. You know, uh, our organization owned six minor league teams at the time, and so Bill got promoted because the uh, the CEO in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, had health issues and he had to retire. So they promoted Bill in January, and they promoted me to stay in Greensboro. So I got to run my first team at 26 years old. That was just a you know, it was a huge opportunity, um, and then I just kept progressing. Ended up getting to Erie, Pennsylvania. And it was in Erie, Pennsylvania for two years. And we were trying to get a stadium built in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, because we were playing an old rundown WPA project and the concrete was falling off the off the walls. And uh, went to a league meeting in October of 1993. This is like 30 years ago, which is ridiculous to, to even think about. Um, two gentlemen came to the league meeting from Dutchess County, New York, and said, we have an idea for a baseball stadium. Would anybody listen? And we decided to listen. The owner, Marvin Goldklein, was from Livingston, New Jersey, so he's familiar with the Hudson Valley. I grew up in central New Jersey. I was somewhat familiar you know, with the area, and six weeks later, we announced we were coming to Dutchess County. Um, that was December 1st, 1993, so 29 years ago. And another part of the story that I thought was also really great was you mentioned mm-hmm. about you had sold all the seats, mm-hmm. but yet there was still some some dilemmas in opening up opening oh. day oh yeah uh, we we took uh, deposits for 1500 season tickets and we had about a thousand people on a waiting list uh, could we cut it off because we didn't want to just sell out the ballpark to all season tickets we want everyday fans to come so we cut off season tickets had a waiting list for season tickets um but we didn't have a ballpark because uh all the political leaders as mm-hmm. happens in many situations couldn't get their act together, and they were bickering and battling and didn't like the deal that we had struck originally to come. They wanted to renegotiate. And so opening day is June 18th. We made the announcement we're coming December 1st. We have seven months to build a stadium, and we get to town officially in January, and then we hear from the county attorney that we have to renegotiate the lease. That took another two months, so now it's March, first week of March. We finalized the lease agreement in March. Now it has to be voted on by the county legislature and that doesn't happen until the first week of april so i think it was april 6th the night of april 6th 
the uh, controversy over building the stadium was so huge in the town that we had to move the legislative meeting from the legislative hall to the civic center. And it was a wild night. We'll just put it that way. We had fans. We, we, we um, printed up placards with the Renegades logo on it. And we had, you know, it was like a political convention, you know, with the little signs that everybody has. And uh, the debate on the floor of the legislature went to like 12.50 a.m. before they voted to approve the stadium. So now it's, now it's April 7th. Opening day is June 18th. We built the stadium in 71 days. Wow. Um, and got open. So uh, it was both the most exhilarating and most stressful time of my life. It was unbelievable. Fold out crowd, 4,500 people, opening night, the stadium. Uh, perimeter fencing was snow fence. Uh, the uh, bullpens were being, uh, the right field, home bullpen in right field was still being built through the first six innings of the game because <laughs> we needed that, the the warning track and the runway down in right field is the access to the field for the trucks. So we had to get all the trucks off the field before they could start building the home, uh, home bullpen. Uh, we were painting the foul poles up till 6 PM that night before we opened the gates. Yeah, it was, it was mayhem. It was craziness, but um, the parking lot was all dirt. So if it rained, it was a mess, uh, but we got through it. Uh, fans so were very, very patient. Uh, and put up with it because they had their own baseball team. And it was unlike anything I've ever experienced or will never experience again in my life. It was just the perfect storm of the times because in 1992 and 93, anybody who lived here maybe remember, that was when IBM had their uh, their cuts of employees. With I think they dropped like 20,000 people got let go from IBM, and it was the whole lifeblood of this community. And the economy was really depressed, and they needed something to feel good about and to turn things around. And so that we were the first part of really the economic redevelopment of Dutchess County to diversify the economy after IBM cut mm -hmm. back. And the fact that we're 65 miles from Yankee Stadium in New York City, and a lot of baseball fans, Mets and Yankee fans, no longer had to go to New York City to enjoy professional baseball. Uh, location, location, location. The stadium is right on the interstate, a few miles off the thruway. Yeah. Uh, we were able to trap people from, you know, Orange County and Rockland County and uh, White, uh, Westchester County. It was just a perfect storm, perfect time. And, you know, I died and went to baseball heaven. <laughs> really, all of us who worked for the Renegades are extremely fortunate. If you worked in other cities, you know, from a baseball operator's standpoint, I and the reason why I sort of left after uh, after eight years with the Renegades, uh, the dream of every baseball operator is to go into virgin territory. It's never had a team before, never had a stadium before, and you can do it your way from day one. And I was able to do that. So I started the Renegades uh, with a really great dedicated staff, but we were able to do it our way. We didn't have to follow somebody else or try to fix things that, you know, other people did that didn't fit with our values and the way we wanted to do things. Um, we could start start and do it our way from the, the beginning, and that was really, really rewarding, and that's a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-career experience, really. Mm. Um, and my next move was either going to be to another team in another city, and before I got to the Hudson Valley, I had moved six times in 12 years. So it was every other year. It was like a military life. And I said, I'm done. I'm tired of moving. <laughs> if I go anywhere else, I have to work 80 home games or 72 home games. That's not attractive. I'm working here making working 38 home games, which is a nice <laughs> number of games. Um, I, I'm not going anywhere else. I'm either going to work do this, I'm going to leave baseball and, and, and stay in the area. Uh, it's two hours from where I grew up. I love New York City. you know, And so this is where we want to be. Um, and I uh, just decided that it was time to move on and do something else and take on a new challenge. Mm. So. That's incredible. <laughs> and and imagine, uh, for, for our listeners here, imagine being at Dutchess Stadium. Um, literally, I, I think we were two feet away from first, first base. Yeah. Uh, while listening to Skip tell <laughs> myself and and two other people yeah. the story, uh, not because he wanted to, but because I asked, I did yeah. ask you to tell us the story, yeah. and um, 
Uh, and of course you did want to, which, which was wonderful right. because you, you have such enthusiasm as you share it with us. But it was so cool to um, listen to you share all of this with me and with those other people there uh, while standing there and, and you're telling me about painting a flagpole and I just yeah. turn over and I just, <laughs> I look at that flagpole and I go, holy crap. And um, you know, we hear these stories, right? We, we hear, I, I listen to biographies of entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and business owners and, and we hear these stories of we were literally right before the crowd came in. Um, but you lived so, it, you yeah. experienced it. And, <laughs> and you mentioned that it was both exhilarating yeah. and the most stressful time of your yeah. life. Um, I'm interested in, in you expanding on one of those ideas there mm-hmm. and, and, and the learning that came out of that, the lesson that you gleaned from it. Okay. Before I get to that, one other thing that you, sure. you, you triggered. The thing that yeah. happened that was most memorable before we opened the gates was all of us had to go into the restrooms and flush the toilets incessantly to get the water pressure up so we had enough water pressure in the ballpark. Oh it's something I hadn't thought of for a long time and it just triggered it. We, all of us were running. We're, we're just flushing all the, all, all, all the, all the urinals and all the, all the toilets just to get the water pressure up before we can let people in the stadium. It was, that was, uh, uh, that's a memory that just came roaring back to me. Wow. Um, so that was pretty funny. I mean, there's just uh, so much that yeah. goes into it that yeah. nobody realizes. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. Uh, you know, well, everywhere we, so the exhilarating part of this is as I said you always want to do it your way from yeah. the start right and not having to fix other people or do something differently to try and regenerate interest or whatever and so that that was the cool thing but the fact that we had such outpouring of support mm. I mean people wanted us so bad I've never you know we could have sold anything with the Renegades logo on it, and we did almost. Um, but it was just the outpouring of support. People wanted it so bad. We were just giving them something that they really wanted. So it was exhilarating to have that much interest in something that we were putting on. And we were really stressed because we wanted to do it right, and we wanted to treat our fans right. Um, and so that was – it was cool. You know, it was uh, – back then, that, those first days or weeks, you know, there was really – there's really no thinking about whether it was exhilarating or stressful. It was just we just had to get it done, right? Getting right? it done. Um, you have five thousand people knocking on your door, you know, waiting for the gates to open. It's you know, it's 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 both exhilarating and, and, and stressful. And, and, yeah. and stressful. If, if you ever hosted a party, you yeah, know the stress that goes into exactly. having the guests arrive when you're still <laughs> trying to put the food on the, the table. Yeah, exactly. And you yeah. got to flush the toilets to get the water pressure <laughs> yeah. up. You know, and you got to worry about whether you know the foul poles are going to be painted or the seats are screwed in at the last minute. Right. So there's all sorts of stuff going it's on. An, um, but it was, it was cool. Um, but just the a few years later, um, towards the end of my career with the Renegades, we did this thing in, the, in our uh, press box with their staff during, during the off season to try to, try to re recalibrate and, and mm-hmm. launch the next phase. And they said, what's, what's our purpose? Why do we exist? Mm. Um, and I took, the staff through this little activity to create our purpose and it was really hard because people really didn't get the concept of our purpose but what we ended up after probably three or four hours of debate and beating uh, beating up uh, each other over the language but what we came up with is that our purpose was to create magical moments and memories for our community you know and that's what kept people coming back that's that's what our focus was to do just create an experience mm. for families in our community that would be lifelong memories and keep them coming back. And now, thirty years later, we've got you know generations, you know, coming back with uh, with their grandparents that used to be you know first generation stuff. So that's pretty cool to see that at the ballpark. Now I'm not involved anymore, but to go back there and to see yeah see that and the hear those stories is, is pretty cool. Um, and. Uh, you know, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Yeah, right? yeah. It's something that I'm really glad I experienced. It. I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad I'm. I'm really proud of the fact that this is the legacy of my career. I was able to bring professional baseball in Dutchess County, um, but it's also something now at this age I never want to go through and do again. <laughs> and and the, and the fruits of your labor. Um, you, you have a championship ring that on, mm-hmm. on on your hand and that yeah. you get to wear and that you you use in some of your marketing and in some of. Uh, um, some of the yeah. language in, mm-hmm. in some of your coaching programs of yeah. championship cultures. Yeah. Um, something I want to highlight in, in what you said um, of the exhilarating part that um, 
I think sometimes is forgotten mm -hmm. in in business is the support, mm -hmm. the the community support is is knowing that people have mm -hmm. your back mm -hmm. and that people want what you have right. um, to offer. That is, and uh, I just think that that is so important for us to remember is the is that support and and that community yeah. around us and to be grateful for it. Um, you also mentioned uh, and, something, and you also have to work to nurture it too and do the right things for that community to keep them. Which is the experience, yeah, yeah. And, and how important the experience is, and, and on a, on an even, uh, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm a basketball guy, right? Mm -hmm. So I follow the NBA, and I know Mark Cuban um, when they were talking about the kind of like how he revitalized the Dallas Mavericks, and they asked mm -hmm. him in a podcast, or actually it was a radio, uh, it was Opie and Anthony show he was mm -hmm. on, um, uh, how he went about doing that, and he said we just wanted to create a really great experience yeah. for families. And that's what they started doing. And, and next thing you know, the Mavericks are in the playoffs. Yeah. And it, it, that when you create, so this is great. This is a great transition for what you do today. Um, when you create this culture mm -hmm. um, with your fans, with your support network, um, it starts bleeding into the business. Mm -hmm. It starts bleeding into the employees. Mm -hmm. And then when you create that mm -hmm. culture with the employees, it, it just mm -hmm. maximizes their potential. And so the work you do today yeah. is is essentially that of going in and working with uh, teams. I remember you giving a speech at Toastmasters about Peter Drucker mm -hmm. and something about culture eats uh, strategy for for breakfast for lunch or breakfast for yeah, breakfast whatever. right. Yeah. And you had a different spin to it. Uh, would you do you remember what I'm bringing up? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it's culture eats strategy for breakfast, but um, you know it's it's really the, the the character of the employees, right, and the mindset that really you know. So so it's character. No, Drucker's thing is is culture eats strategy for for lunch, and I said, oh, well, it's the character that eats your culture for breakfast, mm. right? So you've got to get the right character of employees to create the right culture. Right, um, and if you don't get that right, you have no, no, no chance of getting the culture right. So it can eat, eat, eat the strategy, right? So, so you want to get the right culture, but in order to get the right culture, you have the right character uh, in your employees. And I was just having this uh, conversation with uh, with somebody before before I came over here with a, a former client. We're looking at possibly doing some additional work um, with. with Exactly that point. You know, one of the, one they have a, a subsidiary company that they're having struggling with, and they said, "Well, you know, they just had to let their actually the CEO go um, because it was a friend of the owner, and he didn't vet the guy, you know, for the right things. Um, but he thought he'd be good, but he wasn't, and he was bringing in all these people who didn't have the right character." I said, "Yeah, you got to get that right. You know, you've got to get the character right. You've got to vet people for the right values, right, and the work, right work ethic, and." And their, their purpose and their mission, you know, are you aligned? Mm -hmm. you know, why do you want to be here, basically, right? right? Um, and if you don't get that right, it's going to be a struggle. And and the leaders have something to do with that. And uh, so I'm interested in, in how much of a role uh, Mr. Dice, Mr. George Dice, hmm. played a role in helping you realize that for yourself. Yeah, that, that that's one of the guys who, you know, talk about, you know, Richard Anderson was really instrumental in allowing me to move into baseball and perpetuate my my career at an early age, and so I sort of see him as a as a mentor. But George Dice was the guy who taught me <laughs> how to be successful um, in 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 professional life more than anything. It was baseball was the industry, um, and he taught me some communication stuff that I still teach today. Um, but he was just a guy who he was a true mentor. He really wanted you to succeed, obviously for our business mm -hmm. sake, but I really think some of the feedback he gave me was really life, life skills. I mean, yeah. 24, 25 years old, you know, he said some things to me that were, you know, uh, things I didn't really want to hear, but needed to hear. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you said too, in your bio to yeah. me is that, uh, there were a lot of teachable moments and yeah. he took the opportunity to teach you and, yeah. I, and gave you, space to make mm -hmm. mistakes and yeah and 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 the coach me on on it you know uh the one thing i i'll never forget you know there's, it was you know in, in the south atlantic league as we were it was southeast was back then it was uh north carolina south carolina georgia i think 
for the most part, our teams were in. It gets pretty hot down in the south. And so <clears throat> we would play day games in the spring on Sundays, and then we play night games in the in the heat of the summer. But early on, um, my first year as, as CEO of the team, he would he was in Nashville, so he was like 500 miles away. He'd only come like twice a season. Um, but this one weekend he was there, and it was a Sunday, and I had my uniform on, which was khakis with a golf shirt, uh, team golf shirt, um, and I had boat shoes on, but I didn't have any socks. <laughs> and he basically t- talked to me after the game. He said, uh, you need to wear socks. And he wanted he wanted a particular look on our staff, right? mm. and he expected it. So just those little nuances to make sure, just like ballplayers have to have their uniform particular, you know, uh, sure. particular way. he wanted our staff to have a particular look, including me, because I was right. the leader of the team. Um, and so, yeah, just little things like that, you know, that, that, that made me a little more conscious of how I was approaching being, things. Yeah, approaching things, how I was being perceived or what, what I was putting out there. Um, and then there was a two or three real – uh, what I thought were pretty egregious communication mistakes that I made where he gave me a second chance. I mean, the first one, I totally screwed up and had the game time for a road game wrong, and we, we missed the game. We <sighs> showed up two hours late for a game. Uh, got to the stadium, ballpark was all locked up. <laughs> um, and I could have been fired. I probably should have been fired right for, for that. We embarrassed our team, we embarrassed the Boston Red Sox, our major league affiliate, the whole league. Now, this is 1987. Imagine if this was today with social media. Oh, my goodness. I would have been, you know, skewered. Well, 87, did Bill Buckner, That was was that before or after he missed that catch? Yeah, it was 86. So so you were all right then. <laughs> you still had it. You still were on his coattails. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> to make some light of it. Yeah. He might have saved your job, actually. <laughs> well, yeah. Although, again, you think about today, though. Yeah. With social media. Oh, you would have been gone. I've been skewered. Yeah. Um, but back then, you know, we could keep, well, it, let's, we could keep it within our little family. You know, you mentioned teachable <clears throat> moments, right? So let's think about it in, in today's time. So in today's time, that happens. You're going to be all over social media. He's going to have heat for it. If Let's just remove you from the situation. If you coming in as who you are today, mm-hmm. as, as a leadership coach, yeah. as somebody who comes in and helps, helps communication yeah. issues in a, an organization – how, how do you think would be the best way to handle it? So you have you have this this CEO who who's good at his job and yeah. just made a mistake here, yeah. and you have this this mentor here who's who's really yeah. knowledgeable and is is helpful. How would you be able to come in to be able to maybe help a ball club today if that was the mistake they made? Yeah, I think uh, again, I think it's yeah you have to really look at it in terms of uh, patterns. You know, a one off is a mistake, right? But that's a second second thing happens, now a pattern's starting to build, <laughs> right? So uh, I have no problem giving people a second chance. I think you've got to give people second chances because nobody's perfect, and so make it a teachable moment, a learning opportunity. Um, make sure, though, that there's learning from it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if it's something that's that egregious, it can't happen, it can't happen again. Mm. Well, you have to make sure you're... You're doing the right thing and you're following through. You know, there's there's a lot of moments along the way, you know, where some of those things could have got caught, right? And they, again, they didn't. They fell through the cracks, right? Um, and so, no, but I think you I think you just have to give people second chances. I have no problem with second chances, but if it, it, it becomes a pattern, mm-hmm. you, you have to deal with it. The other thing is you have to address things when they happen. How many times do, do things happen and they don't get addressed until it's farther down the road, Right. And something might happen the second time or a third time. And it's the third time when you finally decide you have to address it. Right. Now, is that fair to the individual? <laughs> right. right. You almost allowed those second and third mistakes to happen because you didn't address it. Right. So I'm a big believer in dealing with things with uh, promptly, as I say, promptly, directly, and respectfully as, as the three traits to bring to leadership communication. And if you, if, if it happens a second or third time and you haven't addressed it the first time, it's your fault. It's not the it's not the individual's fault. <laughs> you know, and and I think that's where a lot of leaders get it wrong. 
Yeah. And and you can you kind of talk about that. I'm I'm going to go over your three uh leadership approaches mm-hmm. uh because I think that they they lead into that. But before I do that, um I think what you just addressed there if if we're looking at the mistake that happened to you back in 87 today, it's if you were to go in, it sounds like what you would do and and what would be a good idea for anybody to do internally would be to look at the processes that allowed the mistake to happen as you said because right. there were processes in place that didn't catch the, the error in time. Right. And so something was wrong with the processes. So look look at those mm. processes. Um, and then to look at this employee, look at this person mm. that is in charge of whatever it is that they're in charge of. Mm. And what is the pattern? Are they dropping right. the ball in other places that right. maybe have not been seen? And this one we were able to catch. Right. And if they're not, then obviously, as you mentioned, there's room for, for growth and room to learn. Yeah. But if they are, then that's something to obviously pay, pay very close attention to. Yeah. And then the, the, third, the, the third and last part goes into your, your leadership approaches, mm-hmm. which is to address things directly. A- and that's challenging. Um, I think we learn mm-hmm. as Toastmasters how to give feedback, which is mm-hmm. a really great part of Toastmasters. And when someone gives a speech, we, we give feedback. Mm-hmm. And the feedback is to be constructive and to help them yeah. move forward. And so some of the feedback sometimes is not great feedback. It might say, hey, you said too many ums, too many crutch words, or, you know, I kind of mm-hmm. lost you in your speech. You kind of went off the rails a little bit. And, and then you uh, and then right. you help them by giving them some guidelines, say, saying, hey, listen, right. maybe find a common thread and you could work your way around that. Maybe take a deep breath and then right. you don't have the ums. So helping them, and we learned that in Toastmasters. And so when you... Um, give advice or, or directly approaching something to give them feedback in a way that's constructive. So your three leadership approaches are command and control, avoid and let go, and Goldilocks, mm-hmm. just right. <laughs> and uh, we, we know that the third one is, is probably the more appropriate one, but uh, why, don't, why don't you share a little bit about those three? So this is something I've developed after probably about 10 years of coaching because what I realized was the situations I was being brought into to work with organizations on, basically, anytime they bring me in, it's, it's usually there's something going on with the culture. It's a negative culture. It's um, there's um, very stressful, somewhat toxic cultures. And what I realized by looking at a number of different situations, there was one style of leadership is the command and control. It's my way or the highway, very authoritarian, right? Aut- mm. Autocratic. That creates a certain environment mm-hmm. that can be toxic, very stressful, um, because everybody's on edge and right they're walking on eggshells and they can't say things or do things without feeling like they're going to get their head chopped off. So that creates a negative, toxic culture. Then I noticed these other work environments where the leader was sort of laissez-faire, hands off, letting things go, letting people just do their own devices and things are just kind of willy-nilly, whatever. There's no structure in place. And so that's the avoid and let go. You got command and control, avoid and let go. And what I realized is that both of those leadership styles create the same negative toxic culture for different reasons, but you get the same outcome from it. (laughs) Um, So what I realized is that you have to have, quote, command and control to some extent. You have to have sort of a a, a laissez-faire, avoid and let go to some extent, right? The, too much of a good you know, good thing isn't right. So you got to bring the best of both of those strategies, right? You want to be uh, hard when you need to be hard, and soft when you need to be soft, and to mesh those two. And that's the Goldilocks leader that is able to mesh those things. Um, and it's about really on the front end, sort of being command and control on the front end. And then what I mean by that is really just setting clear expectations. Mm. This is what I expect from you. This is what you can expect from me, being very transparent on what what those expectations are. Right? Um, and then sort of allowing the person some freeway and um, freedom and leeway into uh, providing those expectations and performing and showing up in their own way within that structure. Um, and then giving people feedback when, when, when required in a prompt, direct, and respectful manner. Um, so it, it's not easy to get the right, the right balance of those. Um, and that's where real leadership comes in. You, know, you really, and that's what I think George Dice did for me. I mean, he was really good at letting me do my own thing. And, and but when he needed a real 
<laughs> reel it back in and be very direct and candid with me. He was able to do that, and and I think he developed a, a great style from from that standpoint. But that, that it was really eye opening for me to see in over ten years or so of coaching organizations that there's those two different leadership styles, totally opposite ends of the spectrum, but they created the same environment mm. because of you know. Of, of the what one later each one was missing from the other, and I think because of the inner inner office politics that happens, mm-hmm. right, is that mm-hmm. people start talking internally and they start coming up with their own kind of like uh, their own philosophies. Because yeah. if one, if you're to that point where you're so aggressive and and assertive as a leader, um, your your team kind of they turn away from you almost. They kind of turn you off. Mm-hmm. And they create their own culture. They 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 do the yes sir yes ma'am in front of you, but they create their own culture culture aside from you, right? Right, and they figure out ways to manipulate the system and 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 everything. Yeah. And then the same thing with the laissez faire is that because you're not there and you're not mm-hmm. present and you're not yeah. doing anything, they create their own culture, their own rules, their own set of guides. Right. Because it's almost what we need. Um, yeah. I've, people, I've, people need structure and, and want and want structure, and if they don't get it. They're, they'll create it amongst themselves, and sometimes it's not. And and sometimes it's not so bad. Um, but I, I've learned this myself in in what I'm doing with Denton. So um, m- uh, many of our audience know I have Denton, uh, my my insurance company, and um, I'm I'm new to this. Yeah. I'm new to this. I'm learning. I started this podcast so I could learn from people yeah. like you, Skip. You yeah. know, and. Um, Recently, I started having team meetings where we're focused about sales. Mm-hmm. And in these team meetings, um, I went over, here's how many calls, how many mm-hmm. appointments, how many sales we should be looking at. And I won't go into, go into specifications. And um, we kind of had a, a little bit of a conversation about it. I, mm-hmm. I said, here's what I used to do. Here's, mm-hmm. here's what I used to do and what, what made me successful in sales. And, um, and here's what maybe my expectations are. But what do you think of them? Mm-hmm. And they came with a different approach, a different number. And I said, well, how about we meet in the middle? I didn't say it like that, but we found a number that met in the middle for, for all of us where we're comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and we decided on it. And a couple things came out of that in that um, they played a part in, in coming right. up with the number. And I think you also mentioned it with, uh, with the uh, command and control in that yeah. I wasn't just telling them the number to where they would just check a box. They came up with the number themselves that they feel they can right. truly live up to. Right. And so, and, and it also is a number that makes sense for the business. It, it also works for us. And what came out of it and why I bring the story up is actually um, Jim, uh, one of our sales executives, uh, said to me at the end of the meeting um, and in front of everybody, he said, I love this. I love this accountability. This is what I needed. Mm-hmm. He literally said that. He said, this yeah. is what I needed. And in our next meeting, I, I did part of all of this is follow up is Mm -hmm. you could say this and then if you never go follow through with it then so in our next meeting i said all right where are we at right and we we went around and everybody shared and he Mm -hmm. he lit up he was so Mm -hmm. excited to share his wins but also go over his challenges and we 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 role played about them so uh i i learned firsthand from this method that you're talking about how it works um and uh now i'm interested in the goldilocks Uh, is that something Mm -hmm. you came up with yourself yeah, it's just something I looked at. I said, you know, you got this command and control on one side, laissez faire on the other side. We really need to take the best of both and bring it, you know, bring it to the center. And that really is the quote, just right way to, way to lead or lead. And um, yeah, so that's my little concept on the Goldilocks leadership. Yeah. And I'm sure people enjoy it. So I, re- I remember in a meeting that you and I had even uh, longer ago, uh, mm-hmm. we actually ate at a at a restaurant that's no longer uh, right across from Vassar. And you were sharing with me your Tony Robbins experience. Mm. And so you were a CEO of the Renegades. And I guess uh, the passion, mm. something happened, wasn't there. And it probably was because you were fine, you're trying to find this space. And uh, you were going through some things personally as well. Yeah. And you started following Tony Robbins. And it, was some, it impacted your yeah. life so significantly that I think it probably is part yeah. of what you do today. I'd love for you to share some of that with us. Yeah, so yeah, I was going through a challenging time in my life, uh, both personally, mostly. Uh, my wife, first wife decided that she wanted to get out of the relationship, uh, which I don't blame her because I wasn't really happy either. Um, she just had more of the courage. <laughs> that was the coward uh, to, to, to bring it up. Um, and that was also the summer where I came to the realization that it was time for me to do something else. I, wasn't, mm. I was, I'd lost my passion for what I was doing. 
And so a couple of weeks after my wife and I separated, this flyer came in the mail from Tony. He was coming to New Jersey and for a weekend. It was an introductory program, uh, the Unleash the Power Within weekend. Mm. And it was in New Jersey in February of 1998. And I decided, I got nothing to lose. Let me just go see what this is like. And I spent four days with Tony and 2,500 other people. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Uh, Sunday night uh, at the program, he does this long two and a half hour basically sales pitch for his program called Master University. And I went home to the hotel that night and I had the schedule for Tony's Master University and I had the Renegade schedule and I had my 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 calendar, my day planner. And I looked at how things lined up and then I said, well, this is February, so April was the first week-long program. So I could probably make April work. It's not, not a, it's a few months before our season starts. I could probably justify that. The second program was the first week of June, a week before the team shows up to start our season. That might be a little more challenging <laughs> to get away for. And then the third was right after the season ended, but I would need to f- leave for Hawaii the, what would be basically the first day of our playoffs. So, so I'm sitting there, I'm calculating. So I've been in baseball 16 years now, and we've made the playoffs four times. So I figure I got a 75% chance <laughs> of us not making the playoffs. So I think I can make that one work too. Um, I was also able to sort of pull on the, the heartstrings of the owner of the team because he knew I was going through a divorce. And so I put this whole proposal together. This is what I want to do. And, and, and he gave me the go-ahead. Wouldn't you know we had the best record in the league that year? Oh, goodness. And we made the playoffs. Of course. Uh, and we played our first game in Oneana, and I was in Hawaii. And I called back to see how we were doing, and we lost the, uh, the first game in, in Oneana, and then we came back home. Next night... I called back in from Hawaii, and we lost our first home game, and we lost both games. We were knocked out of the playoffs in the first round. So I did okay. <laughs> did <all laughs> I, didn't, right. I didn't miss winning a championship. Too much. Um, but that, uh, that did change my life. Uh, it, it changed the trajectory of what I believed I could do and what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. Um, and it gave me the confidence to take a leap of faith and do something different. Um, I wasn't really emotionally ready or professionally ready or financially ready to make a move. Uh, so I figured I got two and a half years to do something different because that'll be 20 years in baseball. And I figured mm. 20 years is a nice round number to go off on. Um, and so I worked for the next two and a half years to to figure it out. So I did Tony's program. I would did Mastery University in 1998 as a full year. Um, and then I went back and did a second year uh, after going through his leadership training program. And I, I went through this. Uh, Master University, the second year as a coach. And so I was a coach on his teams in the programs. <laughs> um, and that was that was really a wonderful experience. Yeah. What what do you think was the 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 biggest learning piece that you, you took from it, um from the experience or from one of his courses or something? The the thing that I keep coming back to is one one phrase that I think really changed my entire mind. Um no experience in life has any meaning except the meaning you choose to give to it. Mm. Um, and you can reframe anything mm-hmm. to empower you as opposed to you know disempower you. And so I've used that as really a life philosophy, you know, uh, ever since. Um, you know, nobody teaches you this stuff when you're growing up. Yeah. You know, I didn't learn this until I was 39 years old, and I mm-hmm. wish I had learned it when I was 15 years old. Um, so it was, it was really eye-opening, just, the, the, just the, the whole thing. And the internal communication, you know, your internal dialogue and monologue and how you actually have control over that. You Oof. can actually use it and Incredible. do it, um, put you in the right frame of mind, because um, that, that's really what it was all about. It, you know? we, we speak to ourselves so much throughout the day, and if we can reframe the speak that we give ourselves of from that negative talk of what we what we missed, the opportunity we missed, or where we went wrong, or... And we could change that to positive talk. It's incredible what we can accomplish. Um, and the teachings mm-hmm. that Tony Robbins and, and name any, mm-hmm. any motivational speaker today, these go back to the Stoics. These go back yeah. to ancient times um, where uh, we can make our own decisions and our, and our own feelings for things and change our state. Um, that goes yeah. back to ancient times, which is somebody said to me uh, recently, said, you know, it's none of that woo stuff that Tony Robbins teaches. And I said, wait a second. Yeah. 
I said, it's not woo-woo so, stuff. It's real stuff. So the, the, one, of the, one of the, again, another powerful statement from Tony, because you know, it's all about, quote, the power of positive thinking. Sure, yeah. Um, but Tony says this time and time again, positive thinking is great, but it's not enough. So, you know, and he gives this great example. You know, you have a garden, right? Mm, and he says, yeah. okay, positive thinking is there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. No, there's weeds. You got to pull out the weeds. weeds that's right. right. Um, otherwise, they're going to take over the garden, right? So, yeah, there's positive thinking. And, you know, you've got leaders need to uh, s- deal with reality, right? Because mm-hmm. if you just you know, if you just have rose colored glasses and everything looks, looks mm-hmm. hunky dory, you're not going to do what you need to do. And right? so leaders need to look at things as to what's what's real, right? Mm-hmm. What's reality? What's in front of us? Um, and then you have to sort of see things better than they are, right? You have to have that optimism and the hope for that it can be better. Mm-hmm. And it's that looking at reality and having a hope and a vision for how you want it to be different and better is what then drives you to taking the action and doing the weeding or whatever you have to do to yeah. to, to move in that direction. Otherwise, you're just you're just fooling yourself and you're going right. to you know, get run over by the weeds or, you know, there's no truck coming. There's no truck coming. Well, there's no truck coming. Yeah, yeah. There's no truck, you know, trains well, coming right down the tracks. You know? It's taking action. Yeah. It's, you have to, you, you can, you have to have, it, it's a combination. Yeah. You got to have both the, the positive thinking with taking action. Right. And, um, a lot of times in business, a lot of successful business people that you and I meet, um, at, at different events and different places, uh, they have one or, or the other, mm-hmm. or some, some of the really right. successful ones have both. Right. But what we tend to see too, and I'm sure these are the ones that you really work mm-hmm. a lot with, are the ones who have mm-hmm. the implementation, who do take action, right. but don't have the positive thinking in there, that don't see, like you said, a couple steps ahead. Right. What does the future hold? What does the future hold for this employee? What does the future hold for our company? And putting, starting mm-hmm. building that culture out, which is what you do, to resemble what it holds, rather than just implement, 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 right? A lot of the business leaders I come across that I usually end up working with, um, I seem to see them as they're sort of stuck where they are. They're, they're, they've got their blinders on. They're, they, they're just in the action yeah. right now. I just got to get stuff done today. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? What's in front of me right now? Mm-hmm. And they really they don't take that time to kind of, yeah. you know, where do I want to go? What am I doing with this? You know, what can Michael do? do better or, or, or different? Where do I want him to go? What's my strategy for next steps? What's my exit strategy? What Whatever do I want it is, to, yeah. You know, uh, and, and create a plan. It's just they're in it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they need to take that step back and say, okay, where, what am I doing? Where am I going? What do I want from this thing? Yeah. Um, and, and, and to create something as opposed to just – Yep. Keep going to be able going, to see the vision going, going through it. Yeah, they don't really have it. It's, it's oftentimes it's tough for for folks to uh, to do that when they're in the, in the weeds with it all. Yeah, you know, and so it's it's sort of one of my jobs is to get them to take that step back and say, okay, let's let's see where are you going with this thing. What do you really want to do with it? So another check mark where check mark where we align in our in our list of boxes is. Uh, I was at a very low point in my life. Um, I had what I say, I, it was, I was fired for the last time. Mm. And uh, I was making believe that I was going to work. And because uh, my mother-in-law would come and watch the girls for us. And mm. so I, I didn't want anybody to know I was fired. It, I, was, I was embarrassed <laughs> by it. Yeah. I was um, upset about it. Um, in this case here, so I had been fired before. And I had been fired for literally sleeping on the job. I mean, they didn't know that, but essentially my numbers weren't lining up, right? I just, there was, I just wasn't doing the work. Um, but this time, uh, I've, I've, I'd actually got fired for, for a good thing. Um, I, I actually, uh, um, the, the person in charge was, was doing some, some wrongful things. I was part of the leadership team, mm. and I was essentially his secondhand man. So I, mm. I was able to see the things he did, and he shared them with me. And um, uh, I won't get into those things, but um, I, I, I called for a meeting and um, to have him removed. Wow. And uh, and he didn't like that, and so I was no I was terminated the next day. <laughs> no doubt. But yeah. either way, it still it still put me in a dark place of sure. like, why does this keep happening? And um, and I needed to 
reconnect with myself as to find that out. And yeah. so I, I found Tony Robbins. I, um, I believe the first, um, I had, I'd heard of him many times and I, I think it was a Netflix series, uh, a Netflix movie that he has. That's I'm not your guru. Yeah. I watched that and I was like, man, that is something. And I, I believe that that is the event that you had gone to, right? The, um, the yeah. event, the, unleash the power, unleash within. The power yeah. within. So that's what I, I'm not your guru documents. And right after that, I called his coaching program. And I wanted a coach and I, I met with somebody um, uh, via phone and they gave me the number and I was like, whoa, all right, well, that's way out of my league. Mm. Um, but what's the other step? You know, and, and Tony's, you know, his, his courses are $16,000 and, and up and, and to go to one of his events mm. could be five grand and up and all this other stuff. And, and sure, there's people that, one of the people that in, in the movie that, that I watched, uh, she sold all of her furniture, all of her belongings to go there. And, and that's wonderful for her. <laughs> I wasn't in a position to be right. able to do that. Right. Um, but what I did do was I, I bought all of his, of his CDs and they were literal CDs at the time. Yep. Yep. And I, I bought all of his CDs and uh, I downloaded them all into my, my iPod and I would go to this hotel. And actually last night on my way home from a networking event where it was just a wonderful event, I, I passed by this hotel and I was looking at it yep. last night. So it's funny, it comes up today. And I would go to this hotel, the Hampton Inn in New Paltz, and I would go in their lobby and I'd put my earphones <laughs> on and I had my little notebook and I literally took yeah. his courses. Uh, for That's a couple right. weeks straight, and it changed my life. I, I didn't r receive immediate success, yeah. um, but it started changing the way I looked at things. It char started changing the way I approached things, and um, I think that if anybody's listening that uh, this podcast is helping them with, or yeah. can find somebody out there like Skip uh, to help them with, I mean, you know, just listening to this kind of stuff is is really the changing your mindset is really what's going to yeah. help you move yeah. forward. And, and you got to realize, as, as you mentioned, didn't change overnight you know, and Tony talks about this is there's lag time there's lag time between anything that you implement and the outcome and the results you're gonna get and you have to uh, uh, a accept that and know that's the process and don't expect overnight results um, but you know then do every you can do accelerate that but there's gonna be lag time <laughs> there is yeah so be, be aware uh, something that I, that you you brought to my attention in my intake form that I do for this show is the word philanthropic. Um, it 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 seems, I guess, to be uh, one of those words that that we associate with with billionaires or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but philanthropic work to me, when I ask the question of have you done any philanthropic mm -hmm. work, is is really uh, working in the community, is doing the things that that I've seen you do. But you do a lot in our community, and um, one of the things I know that you do is you put on these these workshops for the yeah. uh, the local chamber, yeah. and uh, we get to attend these workshops for public speaking or for leadership, and and they're free. They're just mm -hmm. by being a chamber yeah. member, you get to attend these things, and you put them on. You you give your time for that, and you do other things in your community. I would love for you to share uh, maybe some of the organizations that you've worked with or that you work with currently that that you're enthusiastic about. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I haven't actually I haven't done a lot of it recently, just because of things haven't, sure. haven't haven't aligned much. Um, but yeah, I love doing the chamber events and and uh, other sort of pro bono workshops, especially youth leadership. That's the one thing I did mm. uh, probably for ten or twelve years. Um, I helped craft the youth leadership program for the, what was at the time the Southern Dutchess Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. uh, before it, it merged with the. Uh, uh, Dutchess County Regional Chamber. Um, so, because again, I, you know, I, all this stuff I learned when I was 39, 40 years old, I wish I knew this when I was 12 or 15. So I really want to, I like going back and teaching uh, through the youth, uh, these type of things. Which so, is part of the um, foundation, mm -hmm. the chamber's foundation, right. which is the non-for-profit piece to the right. chamber. Yeah, and so I'm, I'll always do programs for them more more so than the, the, the regular adult part of the chamber, you know, because I really think kids need need to learn this stuff um but yeah so the, the workshops i do on you know leadership communication uh presentation skills and things like that you know is, is it's foundational work that people people need so yeah. you know there's other, there's other community work that you know my wife and i've been involved with um just because you gotta you gotta get back to the community yeah you know yeah. i'm actually you know when you talk about volunteer work and stuff my wife and i met my second wife my current wife we've been married 20 years now um and you know, we met doing uh, volunteer work. You know, I was on the board of directors of the old um, YMCA in Poughkeepsie. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, I was chairing a committee that actually she was recommended to me 
to participate in this in, the, in this committee. And mm. so I reached out there, and she was part of the committee, and we ended up getting together. So yeah, so volunteer work has many different uh, benefits to it. <laughs> benefits, amazing, <laughs> ben- amazing yeah. benefits. And uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. I mean, you are a professional public speaker, and and you've had some really great yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Do you have any uh, speaking engagements on the books? Um, actually, I <laughs> uh, I just or that you're working on. <laughs> Yeah, we're always, always working on uh, sure. always working on opportunities. Uh, but the, the unique one that came through that I'm going to be challenged with uh, in this uh, coming year for 2023, um, I was just booked to do a keynote speech for the uh, Funeral Directors Association. Okay, <laughs> uh, the Maryland State Funeral oh. Directors Association. So uh, I've got to do some research on on that industry. It's going to be unique. Uh, they want to talk about work environment, how to attract, uh, you know, employees Mm -hmm. because the industry is really struggling as many industries are today, uh, recruiting employees. But I think it's an industry thing. People are not going into, Mm -hmm. you know, funeral services or Mm -hmm. or whatever as, as much as they may have had in the past. So, uh, but it's, it's all about creating the right work environment and it's a unique work environment. But I think the, uh, the fundamentals still, still exist Mm -hmm. for, uh, for people in the environment, because you got people who are going into the industry, but then how many funeral homes are there that are competing for that talent? Right. Right. So now you've got to take it from the to the macro level down to the micro level, and if you have ten funeral homes in a I don't know what what the geography a small radius, sure, right, you've got to compete to get yeah. that talent, and so it's it's just like any other business. So. That's that's going to be the message I think they want to hear, and I'm going to create it for them. And it, it's such an important industry when you think about it. I mean, I, you have all the jokes and puns that you could make mm-hmm. with all of this, but um, all of that aside, um, when you just think about it, uh, you uh, as a funeral director mm-hmm. are handling a very sensitive time in somebody's life, a very emotional time in somebody's life. And if it's handled the wrong way, I mean, that's, it could leave a real big stain on your organization. And that's some of the problems they're having with employees because it's very, very intense, very stressful, very, yeah. and they're they're in it all the time. Right. So again, talk about you know self care and your self talk, and they need higher levels of self care because they're yep. they're in such a emotional state yep. all the time for their for their customers. So yeah, it's going to be really interesting for me to just to research the industry. I've I've asked the director, the executive director of the association to give me a half a dozen people to talk to. Oh great. Um, because I want to learn about what their experiences are and what their challenges are so I can craft something that that resonates for them. It's so cool the work that you put in behind your keynotes. Um, I've had the opportunity to experience your rehearsal mm-hmm. sessions where, mm-hmm. where it's, it's really cool. And, and you know, I, I definitely want to put this out there for any organization, any industry that is looking for um, a keynote. Uh, I think uh, Skip put so much time and effort in research, as you just heard of, of um of interviewing people in the industry, um, but then also puts on these these rehearsals mm-hmm. where you you bring us you bring in an audience. Um, some some of us in the industry, like myself, some people mm-hmm. who are not in any industry of speaking of public speaking, they're just there as an audience member to yep. give you some feedback and um, and you put yourself out there. You make yourself vulnerable. Uh, you actually did mention some vulnerability in, in here too. Uh, you make yourself vulnerable to to this audience and you give us your draft. Um, in one of them, your slides weren't working. The pictures weren't coming up. Um, I mean, I mean, you do buy a nice lunch, which is really nice, but but yeah. you you give us your draft and you work through it, and then and then you you you, you wait after and you give out these um, feedback cards mm-hmm. where you ask for all of our feedback written yeah. down, but you also stand there and and accept <laughs> right. verbal feedback and verbal um, uh, uh, not just feedback but also advice and right. and tips or, or things that they liked or didn't like or what resonated what didn't resonate, and what's what's amazing about all of that is that you do it. And then you invite us back again <laughs> and we can actually see yeah. uh, some of the tips, some of the advice, some of the feedback that you received applied right. in your, your next keynote that you do. And it's really cool for me to see because obviously I am, you know, uh, aspire to be at your level. Um, but I think for anybody who's hiring you, uh, for them to know about that process that you go through is that you're not just sitting in a room by yourself yeah. at four walls writing a speech. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that's where it starts. Yeah. But 
you are getting feedback from everybody in that industry, outside of that industry, in the speaking industry, outside of the speaking industry. And I think that that just speaks volumes for your work ethic yeah. that your dad taught you and uh, for the presentation that you give. So I wanna, I wanna thank you for inviting me into those yeah. sessions and I look forward to hearing the one about the funeral homes. Yeah, thanks. It's, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's what people don't understand about, you know, uh, keynote speeching, spe speaking, um, or spe speeches, um, and the fees that are associated to it. Mm. You know, people think, well, you're getting paid that much just for that one hour, uh -uh. you know. Um, but it goes, there's so much involved goes in, deeper. In, in, in doing it the right way. And, you know, the one that you experienced, it was a new topic for me, right? And so I, you know, if I were to do that speech again, I wouldn't go through that process because it's, it's pretty much set and okay, I can yeah. tweak it off the recording that I have. Um, but yeah, the first time you ever create a, a keynote speech when you're being paid, you know, significant dollars to deliver, you know, an hour talk, you, you got to get it right. And if it's a new topic, it's untested in front of any audience. You don't want to go in there cold. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, for both, for the audience and for you as a speaker. Right. Right. It's yeah. nice. And so yeah, you got to do it right. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's a... Hard to say it's a fun process, but it's uh, it's a definitely a learning process, and it's it's great to have have people that care enough that will will help you along the way. So it's sort of a symbiotic relationship. So it it's is great. Yeah. It's pretty cool, and and I think one of the cool things you did that uh, that I I didn't realize you did. You, you gave us all cards. Um, thank you cards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't open mine until I got home that day and, and had five bucks in it for parking. <laughs> and I thought that was so neat. I was like, man, that was really cool. Like, um, you know, just something you didn't have to do, but yeah. you did anyway. And just makes, makes everybody that's in the room feel special. Yeah. And, and I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, so what, what you just, what we just talked a little bit about there is a quote that you live by or one of, because, uh, the one that you said was the most impactful was the Tony Robbins one of yeah. no experience in life has any meaning except the meaning you choose to give it. And we, we spoke about that. Yes. But we'll end with this quote, which is, you can't shut out the risk and the pain without losing the love <laughs> that remains, Mr. <laughs> the Boss, yeah. Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Bruce has been instrumental in, in, in my life. Uh, the, the two key people in my life who have been real outside in influences have been Tony Robbins and Bruce Springsteen. Is no. Barbara Streisand anywhere in there for you? No. Um, no, no. And the reason why I ask that is in one of my speeches, I speak about Bruce Springsteen and Tony Robbins and Barbara Streisand. Uh, well, it, it, just real quick yeah, so that we don't, don't we don't, don't no don't have don't have Barbara in there. Uh, but the, no, I just think that's a great quote because it, it, it it's so true. Everybody wants. Uh, I think it speaks to a lot of things. You know, everybody wants you know the the good stuff, the easy stuff, but they don't want to put yourself out there. You mm -hmm. know, and there's no way to really love anybody without making yourself vulnerable. Right, you know, and it's always a risk. You know, is it going to be returned? Is it going to be forever or whatever? Um, every everything is a, is a is a risk, and we have to we have to put ourselves out there. and We have to be vulnerable, and that's really hard for us. And it's taken me a long time to develop that ability to be open to being vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, so I just think it's a powerful quote that I think we need to embrace. It's it's a great quote. Uh, Brene Brown uh, goes into vulnerability. Yeah. She's got a great special. Uh, I think on Netflix or yes. HBO, and yeah. um, I'm sure you could find her on YouTube. It's got some books out there, and uh, her focus is vulnerability. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's a, a strength um, that we all have living inside of us to be vulnerable, and, and when we allow that to come out, it just opens up new worlds for us. Um, yeah. uh, since I said strength, it, it just brought up uh, one last thing for you, which, mm. which I think is a great place to end for you, is uh, your superpower is... <laughs> What did I write down? <laughs> <laughs> communication. communication. I was going to say communication. I, 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 I hope that's what I wrote down. I, I, I love that. Yeah. I love that your it's, superpower is communication. You know, um, and the, 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 that's all we have is communication. That's you it. Know, it's, it's, it's ongoing. It never stops. It's 24-7, which people don't really understand. Yeah. Um, and I believe communication is the cause of every success, every failure, and every frustration. And uh, we just have to keep getting better at it. Thank you so much for coming in, Skip. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. Great. Thank you for listening to The Michael Esposito Show. For show notes, video clips, and more episodes, go to michaelespositoinc.com backslash podcast. Thank you again to our sponsor, Den 10 Insurance Services, helping businesses get the right insurance for all their insurance needs. Visit den10.io to get a quote. That's D-E-N-T-E-N dot I-O. And remember, when you buy an insurance policy from Denton, you're giving back on a global scale.
This episode was produced by Uncle Mike at the iHeart Studios in Poughkeepsie. Special thanks to Lara Rodrian for the opportunity and my team at Michael Esposito, Inc.